at Oakland. Good evening, Oakland. Hold on, I'm going to take care of some business real quick. <laughs> Very observant. Only because Caitlin threatened me. Caitlin threatened me. Okay, there we go. Good evening, Oakland. Welcome to worship, whether you're here in the sanctuary or whether you are worshiping with us online. Uh, we're so glad that you're here for our, uh, our, our Christmas Eve service. If you are new to uh, Oak Lawn, or if you are new-ish to Oak Lawn and have not filled out one of our Connect cards um, to help us, to help share your information with us so that our ministry team can get to know you, um, please see one of the greeters uh, for a Connect card, and you can put that in the offering plate or hand it to myself or um, one of the pastors. Um, we are so glad that you're here for um, the Christmas Eve service as a part of our From Barriers to Thresholds um, series, you will notice our altar of plenty here. Um, no one should be without uh, during this season. And so if there are things that you need from the altar of plenty, feel free to um, take them and utilize them. Um, it's here, for, um, it's here for, for you to use and for you to utilize. Um, just a couple of announcements, a couple of things that are happening in the life of the church. Our digital worship, uh, so on Sunday the 26th, we'll only have a digital worship. We will not be worshiping in the sanctuary. Um, so we'll see you on Facebook Live for that worship experience together. And then our new sermon series, um, The Crowded Table, begins on Sunday, January 9th. Again, we're grateful that you're here. Let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Oh, the time. 
all through the season of Advent as we prepared for this moment, for Christmas. We've been exploring how God has transformed barriers to thresholds where doors have swung open, becoming more hospitable to the needs of those in our community. On this Christmas Eve, we declare that the inn, that the threshold to the inn is now wide open and open for business of compassion with room enough for all. The long-awaited Messiah has been born, and on him the light shines. We have only to open the doors of our lives and say welcome. Our Advent journey has led us to this moment, when the light shining through the cracks of the barriers of life become an open threshold to the holy, to new possibilities, to new relationships. What a poignant moment for us this year as the light, the hope, the peace, the joy and love multiplies from one illuminated heart and one illuminated hand to another. star that rose over Bethlehem. May this light also shine in our hearts, in our lives, and in our church. May this light awaken us to possibilities and lead us to greater hospitality. There is room in this inn, a threshold to the holy. online and let us rise and sing together joy to the world.
And now I invite you to hear the word of God from the prophet Isaiah. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in the land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The second reading today comes from Luke 2, verses 1 through 7. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee 
to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time had come for her to deliver a child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for him in the inn. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts as we gather here tonight be pleasing in your sight. O oh God, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. What a joy to be here on this night. At the culmination of a series, those of you who may not have been here throughout this series, um, this is not exactly the set that you normally see. But we, with the help of some creative, beautiful people in our congregation, created an altar of plenty to take the place of an altar that represented a barrier. And instead, this altar of plenty is designed with the intent that you bring what you can and you take what you need. And then we have doors that we've opened week after week after week, representing the doors that we need to continually be about the work of opening. Not only around this building, but all over the world. Wherever it is that you find yourself, whatever doors you find yourself in control of, what ways can you open doors, break down barriers, bring about light, so that others might know the light of Christ. So as we've made our way through this Advent series, we've talked about and looked at scriptures from the prophets. And I think it's quite appropriate that on this night, this prophet's reading from Isaiah, I love this reading, um, that this comes to us on Christmas Eve, that the people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. So I really want us to think about and dig into what that great light might mean tonight. Um, many images may come to your mind when you think about a great light. And in this season, we've been opening doors and lighting candles and breaking down barriers, crossing over thresholds, and the word from the prophet Isaiah feels especially fitting. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, for a child has been born for us, a son given to us. And then the scripture goes into this litany of names, and that's a tradition in the Hebrew Bible to talk about naming. And of course, or maybe not of course for you, Isaiah is not writing about Jesus. For Isaiah, this passage is a passage that's about a regime change, where the powers of one generation are passed on to another. And every time that happens, there's a possibility, an opening, a doorway maybe, that breaks open for God's grace to break through on the stage of human history. And Isaiah is saying that this is the opportunity for us as we pass leadership along to another generation. Another generation that could save us. But that's very vulnerable. It's a very vulnerable thing to confess um, that we might need to let go of something. It's very anti-establishment. And I think that as a church, as families, as we spend so much of our time trying to form the next generation, 
we need to think about how we're doing that. Are we forming the next generation so that they will be just like us? And then maybe even get upset when they're not just like us? I think we've got to think about that. Because the glorious possibility is that God could do something new. Not copy and paste. Not repeat the same old story. But do something new. And in a world that is as broken as ours is, I think that the chance that God can start over the God, that God could create something completely new is nothing short of miraculous and salvific. That's what could save us, is God doing something new. But to realize that kind of newness requires that we prepare the way. That's what we do during Advent, right? Prepare the way. But preparing the way also requires letting go of old ways. Realizing this change of regime from one generation into the next means that we got to work on letting go. Actually work hard, especially if we're the kind of people who get stuck in our ways around things. It takes even more effort to let go. And it also means that we need to support voices that are coming forth. Lift up new voices. The people that are speaking with that kind of renewed zeal. You know, the ones that you hear and you go, mm, I don't know about that. Maybe slow your roll. And listen. Listen to what they're saying, because it's probably something that you need to be pushed on. And I find it interesting that the idea of being pushed in that way sounds to me a lot like part of the process of labor. <laughs> you know, labor, the thing that was happening before Jesus was born, the thing that made it possible, that icky, painful, screaming, pain, labor, because it's not easy. It's not easy to conceive and to push forth something new. It is kind of this letting that which has grown up inside of you get out. You know, it can't stay there forever, right? So what has grown inside of you must come out. And it's not easy. So on this night, I think it's easy to think about it in that kind of warm and fuzzy, cozy, Christmassy, jingle belly kind of way. But this was a night of um, great joy and great pain. And I think it's only appropriate that we hold them um, together. And it's interesting, too, to me, because I think that um, this whole notion still of, of giving birth or passing on to another generation that which you know, um, oftentimes we take a little too far and want it to be a, an exact replica. But the reality is that once your child comes out, and just use this as a metaphor, if you don't have children, it's okay, this still works. Once your child is outside of you, they cannot see through your eyes. Instead, you sit face to face, looking into each other's eyes from opposite perspectives. I mean, quite literally, opposite perspectives. So maybe we shouldn't be so surprised when we get into arguments or see things uh, differently from our children. So perhaps Christmas is a time of letting go, but I think it's also a time that we focus on light. So bringing us back to this original notion of light. What might it have been to see light for the first time? It's a memory I don't have, 
you probably don't either. Um, coming out of the womb and seeing light for the first time. Could that be the great light? I think when we talk about light, traditionally in our Christmas stories, we talk about the great light. Uh, we think about stars, maybe. Or maybe we think about candles because we put them all over our churches. But certainly the star played a significant role in our biblical narrative about the birth of Jesus and also in this Isaiah text. We think about stars, the first light, the great light, the light that is the star over our nativities at home. But I'm thinking also about the way that God shines a light maybe right in front of us, like a lantern. The way the scripture says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet. Maybe that's the great light. Not because it's huge, not that kind of great, but because it's exactly where you need it to be in the dark. Have you ever been in the complete darkness and held a lamp in front of you? It makes it possible for you to see exactly what you need to see. What a great light. I mean, we often also find ourselves maybe in a dimly lit room and maybe you're trying to see something and the light's coming from behind you. And you know what happens is that suddenly you can't see it because the light's not coming from the right angle and you quite literally need to shift your body in order for the light to shine. What are we standing in the way of? Maybe that great light that we need to consider is the light that is trying to come through. And maybe sometimes we find ourselves right in the way. The people who walked in darkness saw a great light. And it also reminds me of Jesus' statement about those who try to hide the light. You know, you know our little song, This Little Light of Mine. And in that song, do you remember the part about the hide it under a bushel? You know what a bushel basket looks like? It's a basket, basket. So what happens when you try to hide the light? Put it under a bushel basket? Well, one of two things can happen, right? <laughs> one, it gets extinguished, right? It goes out. Or, <laughs> it can light on fire, right? You could break out. You set it ablaze. And when you're in a land of darkness, I think we need light. And sometimes it means someone's got to catch on fire. There's so much that we try to do to keep that dimly burning candle still alive. Don't let it, don't let it burn out. So maybe we keep it right here on our altars. Maybe we cover it with glass. Maybe we make sure to keep the doors closed so the wind doesn't come through. Better not let the Holy Spirit in because you never know what will happen to this dimly burning candle. It's exactly what we've done, I think, some of the times as a church. But I think we're getting it wrong when we do that. Because I think the call that I hear in this scripture tonight is a call for the light to break forth. For the light to shine like it has never shined before. To be a great light. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. It'll either blow out or it'll break forth. Choice is ours. 
So here we are, Christmas Eve night. At this point in our Advent journey, at this point in our labor, when it's time to push, time to let it out. And I think it's really beautiful then that the New Testament sets this wonderful backdrop counterpoint to the passage that starts with no light at all. (laughs) No vision, just boring words. Sorry, Caitlin, the reading that you got. No vision, just boring words of the government officials and the power of bureaucracy to try to snuff out light and life. And Luke, in the next two chapters, is going to give us a lot more information about how empires and bureaucracy will try to snuff out new life. And how good they are at it. But here, in this story, trying to manage immigration, trying to take a census, trying to get everything counted, That's exactly the backdrop where God brings life in unexpected ways. And I have to tell you, that doesn't sound so foreign to me. In the midst of immigration, in the midst of making sure that everyone is counted, unexpected things do happen. How will we make a a way, a way for new life and light to shine? How will we lift voices of a new regime? What doors can we open right now, tonight, when we go from here and all the days following? What thresholds need to be crossed? How can we shift so that the light can shine through. Howard Thurman wrote a poem that I think helps us with this. Do you have those? I think you have them. I want us to read it together. This is a poem about the work of Christmas and I'm sure that many of you have seen it before, but I had Caitlin print them so that we can have, can I have one? Thank you. So that we can have them on a card. Maybe you take this card with you, maybe you put it in your wallet, put it in your car, put it somewhere so that you have it. It's right here. And I want you to say this with you, with me. I want to invite you um, to offer this with me. When the song of the angels is stilled, When the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flock, the work of Christmas begins. To find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among others, to make music in the heart. This is the work of Christmas. This is the great light. This is the great light that you can help shine. May it be so. Amen.
In this moment, we open the doors of our hearts to honesty before God about we, what we've done and left undone that created less hope in a hurting world. Let us breathe out this regret. And breathe in the life-giving, forgiving spirit of God. And out again with the peace of Christ. After Jesus was born, the visitors began to show up to his birthplace, spurred by the message of the angels. But what we know is that in the presence of Jesus, there are no visitors. We are all family, with a place reserved for each one of us. The table has been set tonight to receive this sacramental gift and you should have communion elements with you in your pews as well. If you don't, just raise a hand and an usher will bring them to you. 
And so let us hear about those who gathered and join them in the presence of Jesus. From Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20. Nearby shepherds were living in the fields, guarding their sheep at night. The Lord's angel stood before them. The Lord's glory shone around them, and they were terrified. The angel said, don't be afraid. Look, I bring good news to you. Wonderful, joyous news for all people. Your Savior is born today in David's city. He is Christ the Lord. This is a sign for you. You will find a newborn baby wrapped snugly and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great assembly of the heavenly forces was with the angel praising God. They said, Glory to God in heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go right now to Bethlehem and see what's happened. Let's confirm that the Lord has revealed to us. They went quickly and found Mary and Joseph and a baby lying in a manger. When they saw this, they reported what they had been told about this child. Everyone who heard it was amazed at what the shepherds had told them. Mary committed these things to memory and considered them carefully in her heart. The shepherds returned home, glorifying and praising God, for they all heard and saw Everything happened just as they had been told. Your gestation 
in the house of a holy womb through an unlikely midwife of salvific power brought Jesus the Christ into this world, into the inn of simple means, came a life dedicated and anointed by the Spirit to preach the good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who were oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people, a common birth for common people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and sat in the houses at tables with those who suffer and those who perpetuated suffering, laying bare complicity and compassion. His baptism, ministry, death, and resurrection gave the blueprints for the building of church community and rejection of slavery to sin and death you made a new covenant with us to be midwives by water and the Spirit, birthing more hope, more peace, more joy, more love into this world, making more room in this house, at this table, for all. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. In another house, on another night, the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread. He broke it, blessed it, gave it to his disciples, and said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you. And he shared it with his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. For this is the blood of a new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you eat this bread and drink from this cup, do this in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith.
body of our Lord Jesus Christ, broken for you. The cup of salvation poured out for you. O oh God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go forth in the strength of your spirit, breaking forth, bringing forth your light and your love to all we meet this night and in all the days to come. Amen. Friends, this is probably the moment that we have all been waiting for. The thing that we have missed so much um, since not being able to do it last year. But we have found ways to pass the light from one to another, from distance to distance, knowing that our light could not be extinguished. And the light, that is the light of God in this world. And for those of you who are watching online, we feel you. We know you are there and we are so glad that you are able to join us in this moment. And we hope that if you have a candle at home, you will light it in your holy house. The Spirit makes it possible for us to be connected as we have found out so much throughout this pandemic. And so we're going to now sing Silent Night. And I will invite, will you um, do that? Um, let us sing this beloved song, Silent Night, that has been present through two centuries of ups and downs, steadfast in its message that the light still shines. So stand if you're able and sing with us, Silent Night.
As we come to the end of the service, I want to invite you to turn and to face the doors of our church. And as you turn, look at the faces, the candlelit faces of those around you, those who love you, your family. And as we face these doors, these doors maybe that we come in and out of, I want you to look at these doors as you receive this benediction. May God's door of welcome swing open in your heart and in your life. May Christ's humble first dwelling remind you of the plenty you already know. And may the Spirit lead you into more possibility, more hospitality than you can imagine, making room in the end for all. May it be so for you. May it be so for us. May it be so for this church. Go in peace. Merry Christmas.